In this fourth presentation, we're going to be talking about genomes and complex traits. Today, we're going to have four learning objectives. The first is to describe the basic features of genomes, uh, such as genes, non-genetic regions, repeats, and distant regulatory elements. Second, we're going to explain some functional and non-functional roles of non-genetic DNA. Third, we're going to describe what polygenic traits are and give some examples. And fourth, we're going to explain how complex traits can arise from the interactions of multiple genes and interpret some examples. Recently, Carl Zimmer wrote uh, this lovely book called She Has Her Mother's Laugh, which shows that people are just really intrigued about heredity. You know, what do we inherit from our parents and what is the role of environment? And the answer is, it's relatively complex. So the opposite of she has her mother's knife is he has his father's nose. So most people accept that simple traits are heritable. Think of yellow or wrinkled peas. But it's also true that more complex traits are heritable, such as here, the Habsburg nose. So this is the Habsburg family, a major royal family in Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries. So it is true when people say that babies look like their parents. But of course, how we are is a product of both nature and nurture. And most people would accept that we are shaped both by genetics and by our environment. An example of the genetic contribution might be something like the widow's peak. So here shown, on the left, so that little peak at the top of the forehead where the hair comes down to the forehead. Um, so Whittle's peak is um, a dipped hairline in contrast to the straight hairline on the right. It's presumed to be Mendelian inheritance, although the gene hasn't been identified, it seems to inherit as if it was a mutation at a single gene. Another example would be the ability to taste uh, phenylthiocarbamide. So PTC. People who can't taste this will, um, you, you can put some of this compound PTC on a, a piece of tissue, they'll put it in their mouth, no response. For people who can taste it, it's a very, very horrible taste, um, as shown by the figure on the right. This again is an example of Mendelian inheritance, and the ability to taste PTC um, is due to a difference at a single gene, uh, the TAS2R38 gene. But beyond simple traits that are controlled by a single gene, there are, there are more complex traits that, that make up most of the characteristics we, we think of um, when we think of people today. One example would be fingerprints. So every person has unique fingerprints. But what most people don't know is that they're highly heritable. Your fingerprints are very similar to your parents. In fact, they have a heritability value of 65 to 95%. Now, to put that in perspective, a, a true Mendelian trait has a PTC tasting uh, heritability value of 100%. So fingerprints aren't entirely inherited straight from your parents, but the heritability value is very, very high. And behavior can also be inherited. So genetics has definitely been shown to affect behavior. It's been shown to affect things as diverse as political persuasions, religious beliefs, uh, financial styles, uh, and this makes people much more uncomfortable and is also much more contentious because obviously we think of these as characteristics of us as people that we can change, and obviously they can be changed, but we come pre-encoded with a series of predilections towards particular types of behaviour. And this, this predilection carries through into medical disorders. So, Many complex medical traits are heritable. Um, often we don't know what the causative genes are. That is a, that's a, a, an area of huge study at the moment. And we also know that environmental factors have major additive impacts, right? So these are not just the case of genetics is everything. The environment also matters. But genetics matters a lot in a lot of these medical traits for things like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and others. So today we're going to be looking at this idea of how do we study complex genetic traits. 
And why do we really know so incredibly little about them? To start with, let's go back a bit and just talk a little bit about the human genome. So we know that the human genome contains about 20 to 25,000 genes, so not very many. And they only comprise about 1% of the genome, of the entire DNA sequence um, carried by people. Most of the genome, most of our DNA, is just made up of repetitive DNA, shown here in the green colors, and regulatory elements, so things like enhancers or repressors that turn genes on or off, shown here in the light purple color. Genes only make up a relatively small amount of the DNA that we carry within us. Most of the DNA that we have are made up of repeat elements. Repeat elements are incredibly common. Most of them are non-functional. In other words, they have no effect on how we behave or how we look or any, any sort of medical implications. But many of them do have regulatory functions. The first person to really identify repeat elements was Barbara McClintock, who did the first work on them uh, and their effects and, uh, in the early 70s and, and back into the 60s. And she won the Nobel Prize for this work in 1983. Most of her work was done in corn. Uh, and you can see the effects of transposable elements in these flecks of color in the corn cobs and also in the corn cobs in the picture of Barbara McClintock. But it is important to recognize that the genome is not uh, one-dimensional as we often draw it. So often we draw chromosomes like little X's. That's what you often see in the textbook. In actual fact, it's not like that. It's three-dimensional. DNA has a complex three-dimensional conformation in the nucleus that looks very much like this picture. And different parts of the genome interact in 3D space. And this means that different parts of the genome can come together and interact and have effects. So here we are talking about cis regulatory elements. Now cis is a term that means on the same chromosome or nearby. So here what we're looking at is uh, the beta globin gene. So these are the genes that make the um, hemoglobin protein that is then used to carry oxygen around in the blood. And it has a number of enhancers and other regulatory regions but these turn out to be a very, very long way away from the beta globin genes. So in the brain, for instance, the beta globin locus has a linear conformation, so very much like that picture in the top. Now, you don't need beta globin, this, this oxygen carrying capacity in the brain. And so the beta globin genes in brain cells, they're turned off. But in red blood cells, where you do want this, this function and this hemoglobin made, the beta globin locus has a folded conformation. Those enhancers fold right next to the promoter region, and the beta globin genes are turned on. So the three-dimensional shape of how bits of DNA fold together is absolutely critical to turning genes on and off. And beyond cis regulation, you can have trans regulation or trans regulatory elements. So trans means effectively on a different chromosome. So here we have the example of a naive T cell that turns into different types of, of TH cells, so TH1 and TH2 cell. So in T cells, interferon and cytokine genes are physically nearby. And both genes are therefore turned off. But when these T cells turn into different cell types, so the TH1 or the TH2, the chromosome interaction stops, it breaks. And then the interferon and cytokine genes are turned on. So Regulation is mediated by these different chromosomes that either come together or move apart in three-dimensional space. And this controls the creation of new types of cells from earlier types of, of cell lines, such in this case by the T cells. So here's a class discussion to see if you kind of got this idea. So here we have an example of a modifier locus. Okay, so a repressor, that's a key point, a repressor that lies 100 kilobases away from the insulin-like growth factor, the ILGF gene. 100 kilobases is pretty long distance. This insulin-like growth factor gene controls muscle growth. The repressor and the gene interact in condition one, so that's the top picture, but they don't interact in condition two. So what are the two conditions likely to be? So condition one, condition two, and you've got four options here, A, B, C, and D. Have a think about what you think the answer might be. Stop the video while you're doing it. And when you think you've got the answer, restart the video 
and we'll see what the answer is. And the answer here is D. So let's walk through this a little bit. Why is that the answer? Well, in condition one, notice that the modifier locus is very close to the gene, but the modifier locus is a repressor. So when the repressor comes close to the gene, the gene is turned off. So in condition one, the gene is off, there is no growth. In condition two, that modifier locus is a long way away from the gene, it's not interacting. And so that repressor is no longer repressing the gene. The gene isn't repressed, it can turn on, it expresses, and therefore there's muscle growth. So in condition one, the gene is being repressed, no muscle growth. In condition two, the gene is no longer being repressed, it's turned on, and there is muscle growth. All right, let's, let's go back and have a bit of a recap on some of the ideas you might have heard in the past. So specifically about Mendel's P. So this is a, uh, an archetypal example of how genes, uh, single, single genes, um, can segregate in a population. So if you cross a heterozygous F1 parent, so this is a parent who's got two different alleles, the big P and the little P, then in the F2 generation, so the next generation down, you'll have a phenotype ratio of three purple to one white. All right, so you can get purple in a number of different ways. You can either have two copies of the big P gene, or you can just have one copy, but it doesn't really matter. But you have to have one of those big P's. That will create this, this pattern of three purple uh, flowers versus one white flower. And the same pattern kind of holds when you go to two genes, it just becomes more complex. So if you have two independent genes, so here a yellow color gene, so this is a capital Y, um, or a round shape gene, so a capital R, if you cross a heterozygous F1 parent, so it's got capital Y, lowercase y, capital R, lowercase r, then in the next generation, the so-called F2 generation, then you've got a phenotype ratio of nine yellow and round, three green and round, three yellow and wrinkled, and only one green and wrinkled, as shown in that uh, diagram there, which is often called a Punnett square. So let's see if we kind of get this idea. Here's a class discussion. Imagine that a couple has four children. Now the children have these particular genotypes as shown in this pedigree, so two capital T's, the next one is two capital T's, the next one is one capital T and a lowercase t, and the next one is also a capital T and a lowercase t. All of the children have the dominant PTC taster phenotype. All right, so they, half of them are genotype capital T, capital T, half of them are genotype capital T, lowercase t. They've both got the dominant allele so they can taste. Zero, so none of them are genotype lowercase t, lowercase t. Now the question is, what are the genotypes of the parents? Have a little bit of think about this, stop the video, and then we'll come back in a moment and see what the answer is. So the answer here is D. They can either be homozygous capital T and heterozygous or they can be heterozygous for both the capital T and the lowercase t. So why are the answers, the other answer is not correct? So if you look at A, could they be capital T, capital T, cross with a heterozygote, so a capital T, lowercase t? And the answer is yes, that could be an answer, but it's not the only one. So could it be B? So heterozygote, capital T, lowercase t, for both parents. And that answer could also be true, but isn't have to be it. It could be either of those two answers, which is why D is correct. C is not correct, because if you look at the second example there, a homozygote capital T, all of the offspring will then have to be capital T, capital T, and you couldn't have the, the two heterozygotes that you observe. Here's another class discussion. So uh, a couple have the following genotypes at the independent ABO blood locus and the racist blood group locus. So these are two blood group genes. At the ABO blood group gene, they've got AA and A0. 
the racist blood group gene is plus minus plus minus. And the question is, what proportion of their children will be heterozygous at both genes? Stop the video for a moment, have a bit of a think, and we'll come back to it. And the answer here is B, a quarter. So it's perhaps helpful to draw out the Punnett squares, uh, as we've shown here. So in the upper part of this uh, diagram, we've got the Punnett square for the ABO blood group. In the lower part, we've got the Punnett square for the racist blood groups. And you can see that in both cases, half of the offspring uh, are going to have the required form. So half of them are going to be heterozygous for ABO. That's the AO. Um, pattern there, and half of them are going to be plus or minus for the for the racist blood group. And of course, you want to look at the combination of them. So half of a half is a quarter. So the answer is only a quarter of individuals will have both AO, so the heterozygote for the ABO blood group, and plus or minus the heterozygote for the racist blood group. You can extend this pattern from one gene to two genes to many genes. So we're not going to go through this in any detail, but here's an example of polygenic inheritance, where multiple genes affect the phenotype. So here we're looking at three genes for color, so genes A, B, and C. And we're just assuming there are two alleles at each gene, and that the alleles are additive, but not dominant. And you can see that you can get a spectrum of color phenotypes in the offspring and they're going to have different levels of frequency. So the very light one is only going to be 1 in 64 uh, uh, children. The really dark one will again be 1 in 64, but the middle there, the middle color, will be 20 out of 64. So there's a range of different color offs, uh, in, the, in the offspring using this particular combination just of three genes. And remember that we talked about earlier, there are 20 to 25,000 genes in the human genome. Though, of course, not all of those will affect any particular phenotype. And you can see this in another example, which is eye color. So here you have gene interactions, but you only have really two main genes. So the HERC2 gene and the GY gene. And this leads to three main phenotypes, so brown eyes, green eyes, and blue eyes. And you can see that by having different combinations of these genes and the alleles that they carry, you can get uh, different combinations of, of eye color. So depending on what eye colors your parents have, you can have different eye colors in the offspring. So if both of your parents have blue eyes, then chances are that you're going to have blue eyes. That's uh, what's shown in the far right of that lower part of the diagram. If both of your parents have brown eyes, then 75% of the children will also have brown eyes. And, and so on and so forth for different combinations of the parents. But the key thing about eye color is that there's a large number of modifier genes. So you can get this whole different collection of different eye colors uh, depending on what the, your parents are, uh, both of those two main genes, but also at the collection of other modifier genes uh, that they may carry. And of course, there are some traits that are affected by hundreds of genes. So these are genuinely polygenic genes, uh, gene traits. So polygenic many genes. And a key example here is height. So if you look at height in a population, you'll see that it's essentially normally distributed. It, it forms this kind of bell curve, um, as you've seen here. We now know that height or stature is controlled by over 700 gene variants. Um, and over 300 alleles of each of those genes. So there's a whole lot of different variation right across the human genome that leads to the, to the height that, that you happen to be. And this is why we see so much clinical complexity. So most medical disorders involved many genes and many mutations. So think of any sort of complex phenotypes, such as diabetes or heart disease or stroke. Um, the, the reason that these are so difficult to treat and to understand, especially genetically, is because they have so many complex interactions between so many genes. It is, however, true that some gene variants are more influential than others. So there can be, for instance, both rare and common mutations. So common mutations are found in lots of people, perhaps all around the world. Rare ones might be perhaps found only in you.
but there's also strong and weak predictive effects. So some variants, they have a strong predictive effect. If you carry that particular variant, then there's a very good chance that you will have diabetes. Or they may be weakly predictive. So it might be that overall, if you carry a number of these weakly predictive variants, then yes, you have a slightly elevated risk of diabetes or heart disease or stroke or whatever, but it's not a very strong directive that you're going to necessarily get that particular disorder. And then if you step one step larger, you get into the domain of systems biology. So the proteins that are made from genes interact in a whole variety of very, very complex ways. And phenotypes are ultimately the outcome of these networks of interacting proteins. This is fundamentally why it is so difficult uh, to figure out complex clinical phenotypes or any sort of phenotype. Uh, this is the reason why uh, something as simple as stature or something as apparently simple as stature can be affected by up to 700 genes. It's also important to consider that genes, as we mentioned earlier, are not just influential by themselves, but they interact by the environment. So it's important to consider gene-environment interactions. So what we're looking at here is a graph that shows height versus income in Dutch men over um, much, of the, much of the 20th century. So height has a very high heritability of about 70 to 80 percent, which means that the height of your parents is a very strong determinant of what your height will be. But as we've seen here in this particular graph, height has changed a lot over, over time. So uh, back in about 1870, the average height of a Dutch man was about 164 centimetres. Recently, it's about 184. So that's a gain of about 20 centimetres or about half a foot. But of course, genes do not change over that kind of time scale. You know, the genes that were present in Dutch men in 1870 are fundamentally not very different from the gene variants that are found in Dutch men today. So this change in stature, this change in height, is heavily influenced by the environment. Back in the 1870s, there was much more poverty, lower income, uh, drove the fact that people could afford to buy less food or less high nutritious food, especially during childhood and so they never quite grew quite as tall. Poverty was largely eradicated in the Netherlands. Uh, certainly over time, you've seen this in growth of income over time, and with that growth of income, led to less poverty, better food supplies, and so people managed to reach their genetic potential and became, became taller. But as you see in the right part of that graph, there's a limit to this. So heights haven't actually changed since the late 1990s, or if anything, they've gone down slightly. So you can't just get better food and better nutrition and better environment and get taller and taller and taller. Basically what this graph is saying is that um, we've reached a point where the environmental conditions are so good in the Netherlands that Dutch men have basically reached the, the height that they can potentially ever reach. So Dutch men are never going to be taller on average than about 184 centimetres, regardless of how we change the environment uh, for the better. So a key point from all of this discussion is this idea of human individuality. So as we've seen, genes change more than just our physical appearance. They can, uh, they can certainly change our eye color and our hair color and things like that. But they also at least partially drive how we act and how we behave. All of these interactions are really, really complex and they're a complex interplay between both genes and the environment. So you have your mother's laugh you have your father's nose, and you have whatever else life happens to have thrown at you. Next up, we're going to have a presentation on personalized genomics, where we put a lot of these ideas we've talked about in the last few presentations together into a single common whole. Before the next presentation, if you've got the book, read up about personalized genomics. That's on pages 433 to 435. Learn a bit about genetic variant screening. That's on page 428, but also there's more written on pages 447 to 448. If you don't have the textbook, look up these topics online and see if you can learn a bit more about them. Otherwise, we'll talk about them in the next and last presentation on personalized genomics.